Welcome to Secrets of the Elite. I am Lindsay Williams, your host. I have waited for 35 years to make this DVD presentation. The people who have been friends to me over the years and have given me information, whom I refer to as the elite, are now retired in their 70s and 80s. I have withheld this information for these years out of respect for these people who have been willing to risk oftentimes uh, their position or their retirement in order to be able to tell me things. Let me say, if I may, emphatically, there positively is a group of people on the face of the earth who control the world. Nothing ever happens in Washington by chance. Nothing takes place in the financial world by happen so. Men behind closed doors have decided everything that's going to happen, and my lifestyle and yours oftentimes is controlled by these people, by what they do. These elite of the world know what's going to happen tomorrow morning. There's no question in their minds. Well, let me begin back where it began with me. I had been the pastor of a church for 12 years. I went to Alaska, and after arriving there, I found they were building the Trans-Alaska Oil Pipeline. I went to Alaska Pipeline Service Company, and I said, don't you need a chaplain on the Trans-Alaska Oil Pipeline? Well, they said, we don't know what to do with you. Well, finally, they did, and gave me the Prudhoe Bay area, and from there down to Galbraith Lake, seven work camps. And they just said, go and see what you can do. I did. And a few months later, Mr. R.H. King, personnel relations man with Alaska, came to me and he said, Chaplain, you're saving us thousands of dollars of counseling fees. We aren't having to pay. Your religious denomination is paying your salary. We would like to offer you executive status. And I said, well, what does that mean? He said, go any place you'd like, see anything you'd like to see. And when you happen to be at Prudhoe Bay on the weekends, you're welcome to stay at Arco Base, if you wish, in executive dorms. And he said, we would like to invite you to sit in our board meetings in an advisory capacity in order to help the relationship between management and labor. I had not the slightest idea what I was getting into. For three years time, I sat with, lived in the same dorms with, was across the dinner table from, rode in the vehicles with, and day after day were in the presence of people that the average person never gets to meet. People who control the world, they literally do. Uh, if someone had asked me before I went to the Trans-Alaska Oil Pipeline, Chaplain, do you believe there's a group of people on the face of the earth who control the world? I would have laughed at them. And I would have said, who are you, a John Bircher? If someone had asked me that question three years later, after I had lived with these people, do you believe there's a group of people who tell the president what to do, dictate to Congress what bills to pass, tell OPEC on any given day what they're going to give them for a barrel of oil? I would have said, not only do I believe it, I sat and listened to them talk about it. So now you can understand why I can so emphatically make the statement, there positively is a group of people on the face of the earth who control the world. I remember one morning I walked into Arco Base and Mr. Ken Fromm was sitting there. And he greeted me and said, Chaplain, come on over. I'd like to introduce you to someone. I walked over to the breakfast table and he said, Chaplain, this is Mr. So-and-so. And he called him by name and said, he's the International Secretary Treasurer of Exxon Corporation. I tried my best over those three years time to try to comprehend these people, their mindset. Now, keep in mind, I had been a pastor for all those years, had had many opportunities of counseling with every type of a situation imaginable, had graduated with a bachelor's degree, so I had some idea of how to work with people from my schooling years, and now I had the opportunity to understand people that the average person never comes in contact with. Um, I tried to figure out how they think, what their lifestyles are. And I honestly believe, as I look back over those years now, that the reason I was there was the providence of God. Uh, th there is no way 
that a little insignificant unknown missionary flying airplanes out in the bush of Alaska could have ever lived with the elite for three years time except by the providence of God. And there is no way that I could possibly be here today on this DVD trying to explain to you the things that you need to know in order to be able to overcome the new world order except by the providence of God. I think you're viewing this DVD by God's providence. And the things that I say I hope will be a great help to you in your life so that you can keep food on your dinner table, can overcome the elite and the new world order. And you can if you understand their mindset, but only if you understand the thought patterns, the mindset of these people. I have written numerous books. In fact, I've written six books. My first book was The Energy Nine Crisis. And I wrote it for the purpose of helping you understand how these people think and, and how they live uh, and what, how to comprehend them. Uh, there was a second book entitled To Seduce a Nation. And all of these books are written for the purpose of helping you understand the elite of the world. Now, these books were out of print as of about two years ago. And then so many people said, Chaplain, please, you must help us. We're facing a whole different world of a new world order today. We need to understand the thought patterns and the mindset of these people. So I did. We have it and you can get it. Uh, and even though it went out of print a few years ago, you can go to Amazon Kindle and you can download the book, The Energy Nine Crisis and To Seduce a Nation. Go to Amazon Kindle and you can have those books. And I hope that you will read some chapters there that I'll be relating to on today. I look back over these years and from 1980, my book, The Energy Nine Crisis, the book was published in 1980. Uh, some very unusual things happened. After I wrote the manuscript for The Energy Nine Crisis, I didn't know how to, what to do with the book. I had never taken journalism in high school or college. I had not the slightest idea how to get a book published and to distribute it. And so I thought, well, I'll give it to publishers. Well, I, I sent the manuscript to every leading publishing house in America and said, would you publish my book? And here's the manuscript. Every, every, every publishing house, everyone wrote back and said, Chaplin, it's too hot. You'll get sued. We can't handle it. Now, today that would not be true. Uh, my book, Energy Non Crisis, <laughs> was not controversial at all today. It would not be compared to what it was 35 years ago. But in 1980, uh, then I said, okay, what do I do with it? And I'll never forget, I was in Denver, Colorado, Beth Eden Baptist Church, and a pastor a wonderful godly gentleman, uh, said to me, Chaplain, you must publish that manuscript. He said, the world has got to know what you have lived and your experiences. He said, okay, I'll help you. Dr. Earl Madison, never forget him. He's gone home to be with the Lord now. And he said, uh, Chaplain, I'll help you put out the first 500 books. Well, we did. I never thought they would sell. They were gone in days. Then we published 5,000 books. They were gone in a few weeks. Then we published 10,000 books. They were gone in a few months. Within a year or so, it became a bestseller. People were hungry for the truth. They wanted to know what really is going on out there. And the book told them. At that point, uh, I began getting invitations from speaking engagements all across the country. I mean, day after day. And finally, the mission board that I happened to be with at the time said, Chaplain, you can't publish a secular book and, and still be a missionary in Alaska. I said, no problem. I'll gladly resign. <laughs> after all, there was a whole world out there to tell about what was going on and to tell about Jesus Christ. So I chose that, uh, left Alaska, 
and began traveling. I have spoken in every state in America with the exception of Maine. I wish somebody would invite me to Maine for a speaking engagement. I'd take it just to be able to say that I've been to all 50 states, had the opportunity to travel to Australia, New Zealand, many countries of the world. People are hungry for the truth. And for a person who lived that story, uh, someone said to me the other day, well, Chaplain, don't you have any trouble uh, giving a presentation like I'm giving right now, for instance, on this DVD? And I said, no, the difference in this presentation and the presentation that just a speaker would give at a convention would be he looked in books, he, he, he read newspapers, he, he got current events, and he put together a presentation. What you're hearing today is what I lived. I was there. I saw them. I heard them. I ate across the dinner table from them. I lived in the dorms with them. The most asked question over the past 35 years, any radio talk show I've been on, television show, speaking engagement, public, is Chaplin, please tell us something about the elite. Well, I will. And this is where I began. First of all, a few years ago, someone said, where do the elite live? Well, you need to know this because if you're going to prepare for the new world order, you need to know how the elite have prepared. So I called one of my elitist friends and I said, where's Mr. So-and-so? You know, I, I knew him years ago, but I didn't know where he is now. And he told me. And then I said, well, where is this gentleman? And then I said, where is that gentleman? A and I called a number of the people that I had their phone numbers, whom I call the elite, the super wealthy, the people who behind closed doors determine your life before you ever know what's going to happen to you. And I, I said, uh, I I'd like to know, wh wh where do you live? You know what I found out? Not a single elitist whom I would call the super wealthy, the people who are in the controlling powers of the world, not a single one of them have their primary residence in a metropolitan area. Isn't that amazing? They know something. And I hope you're getting the information now also. They all, oh yeah, they may have their penthouses in New York and Washington, but their primary residents, every one of them, live in a rural area. But my next statement is going to surprise you. The elitists are not survivalist. Now you say, but Chaplain, if the elite know what's going to happen, they understand what tomorrow is going to bring, and it could be catastrophic events, then why haven't they made preparations for survival? Oh, <laughs> you see, since they know what's going to happen tomorrow, they know tomorrow how to do what's necessary to do, where if you wait until after the currency has already collapsed or you wait until after some, uh, someone has bombed a few more uh, like they did in, or I should have say, run, flown airplanes as they did in 9-11. You see, you wait until after the fact because you don't know in advance what's going to happen. The elite know ahead of town exactly what's going to take place, and therefore they don't have to do what you and I have to do in the way of making preparations for these things. Have you ever wondered why so many of the elitists, and I'll name two at this point, by the way. Uh, have you ever wondered why they live to a ripe old age? Uh, one of the elite of the elite would be George Herbert Bush, Daddy Bush. Uh, and another one, if I could name them, would be Mr. Henry Kissinger. They're in their 80s, still healthy. Why do these men live to be such, uh, at such an age? They know some things you don't know. But some things I'm going to tell you today, you will need to view all of these DVDs because some things may be more important to you toward the end than they are now. As a result, I have chosen four people 
to help me with this presentation. I knew that it would take some professionals in different fields in order to do it. The Lord led us to one gentleman by the name of Tom Filer. He's a Wall Street insider. He could walk out the front door of his office on any given day when he was on Wall Street and look up at the Twin Towers before they were destroyed. Some of the things that Mr. Fowler is going to say to you, be, you'll find them fascinating. You'll have to concentrate. I mean, he, he gives a, 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 an approach such as I'm giving, except he dealt with the insiders from one source. I dealt with them from another standpoint. Then I chose Pastor David Bowen. Uh, he was a Hollywood playwright at one time. And as you know, Hollywood is their perversion, and the national liberal media is their mouthpiece. You've probably heard me say that on radio shows. And he dealt with them from that standpoint. Uh, you're going to find what he has to say very fascinating. Mark Johnson, he's going to deal with a subject that I have never heard a definition of that I was satisfied with. You must hear about derivatives. Uh, derivatives could, at any point, that they wish to pull the plug, bring the entire financial system, both Europe, America, the, the Middle East, I, I, I care not what part of the world it is, the Orient, it could bring the entire world to a collapse tomorrow morning if and when they're ready for it to. Maybe some have never even heard of the derivatives, but you're going to hear them now. Then Rodney Balance, you've seen him before with me in a DVD series. You will hear what he has to say. In 1980, when my book, The Energy Non-Crisis, came out, and, and I say this very modestly, and I say it to God's glory, not to mine, because here I was, just a little lowly missionary, flying airplanes out in the bush of Alaska. I became famous overnight. I, I'm not a person that enjoys the limelight, uh, but I, I gained renown that took place very rapidly. I, at times from 1980 to about 1985, I would do two and three radio shows per day. People were hungry to know about the energy crisis and how much crude oil we have. Uh, I averaged crisscrossing America from East Coast to West Coast on the average of every other week by aircraft, commercial. Um, I was speaking day after day in cities all across this land. We were having marvelous audiences. It wasn't unusual back in those days. Can't do it today, of course. The Internet, people, that's about the thing they pay most of the attention to. But back in those days, they would come out to a, a rally. And it wasn't unusual to get 300, 500 people uh, in, in small towns, in big cities, wherever it may be. We had as many as 10,000 people. The largest rally we ever had was in the Salt Dome in Salt Lake City. And because of this renown, there were some people who were watching me, and I didn't know they were there. You never know who's in your audiences. And a group came to me one day, and they said, Chaplain, we would like you to help us. Uh, I didn't have the slightest idea. I knew they were looked like businessmen. They were well-dressed. They were well-spoken, and they said, and you need to understand this expression, I think, that they used back in those days, uh, Chaplain, we would like you to help us get some people out to our seminars. And I said, well, what kind of seminars are you speaking of? Now, keep in mind, they had been in my audiences. They were seeing the number of people that were there, and they said, would you come in contact with a lot of people? They said, we have teaching seminars on the lifestyle and the methods of the elite. Well, I said, that's interesting. I lived with them for three years, and I have the personal phone numbers of a few of them. I wonder if what you're seeing or what you are saying and what I saw are the same. They said, well, here's what we'd like to do. We, whenever you find people in your seminars that you think might be interested in being trained in the secrets of the elite. 
uh, would you be willing to introduce them to us? I said, well, first of all, I have to find out what you're teaching. So they said, okay, uh, we will buy your airline ticket. We'll pay all of your expenses to our resort in the Bahamas. And we'd like you to come out and see. I was amazed. I did. I took them up on the offer. I've never been afraid to go places and meet people. And so I did. Beautiful. Private beach. Oh, you've never seen such facilities, such food. And I stayed there for a week. And I heard some of the most renowned speakers that you could possibly imagine explaining the insides, the, the inner workings of the social elite, uh, how they do what they do. I have never told this story before. And, and I must admit to you that I haven't told it because, not of fear, but out of respect for my elitist friends who are now retired in their 70s and 80s, and I felt that I should only wait until these men had gotten to the place that they could say what one said to me recently. As many of you know, one of my elitist friends passed away a year ago. Some of you have heard me give his name on radio shows. And before he died, he basically said to me, he said, Chaplain, I'm too old to care. Just go ahead and tell the world everything. Well, at that point, I decided I would. And I have told some things. But there are many things I have never told until today that you've never heard until this DVD series. And the things that I saw these people teaching in these seminars at this fabulously beautiful resort in the Bahamas was exactly what I had heard the elite talking about. The, the very things that they said they would do. You see, they make the laws. There's not a single bill that goes before Congress that is not written by the elite. They know what the bill is going to be before it ever gets there. The congressmen don't. Very seldom does a congressman ever read an entire bill. Practically never does a president of the United States of America ever read a bill that goes before Congress. And he signs it. And the congressmen sign it. Who wrote it? I know who wrote it. I heard them talking about these things. When they were talking about what the elite do and, and, and how they act. And I was fascinated. And so I told these people, I said, yes, uh, I'll be glad to do that for you. I said, I know some people that need to understand the inner workings of the elite. And I wanted to know myself. And so they said, okay, if you'll be willing to recommend people of class and quality that you think could understand these things, it would be helpful to them. We'll be glad to pay all expenses for you every other month to come out and be with us at our seminar in the fabulously beautiful Bahamas. And I did. For about two years, every other month, I spent a week at their resort. I remember one day, the airline strip, or the aircraft strip, that was right close to the resort, I happened to have gotten off the plane that I had flown out in commercially, and uh, not many airplanes landed on a strip like that, it was very private, and all of a sudden a 727 Boeing aircraft flew in, large jet, and, and I, I waited to see who was getting out, and the gentleman who was sponsoring the uh, seminar that week happened to be standing beside me. And he said, do you know who those men are? Uh, two of them. Here, this big 727 jet. Now, like you fly on when you fly the commercial airliners. And the side door hydraulically went down. And he said, Owens Corning, one of the large corporations of America. And two of their executives got out of the aircraft. You see... The secrets of the elite are known by every congressman. The secrets of the elite are known by federal judges. The secrets of the elite are known by a few lawyers. But you don't know them. They don't want you to know them. 
They train their young elites as to their thought patterns and their mindset and how they should do things. And as soon as a person arrives in Washington in Congress, I'm going to tell you some of the things they're taught. And you're going to find some very surprising things in the course of all of this. Every president of the United States of America is briefed on these things. And very soon they realize where they stand. I, I'll give you a statement. You can find this one on the internet for yourself. This statement was made by Lloyd Blankenfein. He is the boss at Goldman Sachs. And this uh, was made, the statement was made to the Sunday Times of London, England. And he said, Bankers do God's work. <laughs> Did you catch that? This man said to the London Times, Sunday Times, bankers do God's work. These people think that they have a right to do what they're doing. They are fully convinced that you and I are dumb, stupid, don't understand what they're doing, and most people don't. And, and that's one of the reasons I'm producing this DVD series, because I don't want you to be ignorant of what the elite are doing. I want you to be knowledgeable of what's happening. And the only way that you will overcome the new world order is to be knowledgeable as to how they carry on everything that they do. You might call this a mini college education in, in some fashions. It was 1976. We had finished the service at Arco Base that night, and the men moved out of the way, and for some reason, uh, the senior executive on duty that week uh, had attended the service and was sitting with us, I'll never forget, in the movie hall of all places at Arco Base, and we just sat there and talked a few minutes. I guess he wasn't too busy that evening. And in the course of the conversation, he said something. He said, AT&T is going to be de declared a monopoly. And I, wait a minute. Now, think back, folks. 1976, there was only one telephone company in America. It was American Telephone and Telegraph. If you wanted a phone, if you wanted communications, if you wanted long distance, you went to AT&T. There was no other. Now, how did he know it was going to declare, be declared, declared a monopoly? It had already been decided behind closed doors. He already knew that Congress would do exactly what they wanted and would declare it a monopoly. Not only that, but they had a reason. The elite wanted to declare AT&T a monopoly. After all, AT&T had been in existence as long as Ma Bell had been around. And they didn't need the elite's money anymore. They were well financed. Uh, they weren't borrowing. And the elite don't make money when companies don't have to borrow money from them. They declared, and you'll find this in my book, The Energy Nine Crisis, by the way. Please go to Amazon Kindle and get the book. You'll see it for yourself. It was recorded in 1980 when I wrote the book. Before AT&T was ever declared a monopoly, they knew it, knew what was going to happen. And why did they do it? Because when AT&T was declared a monopoly, that meant that other companies, Sprint, uh, Horizon, all these companies would spring up in their place. And how does a new company start? They borrow money from the elite. So they wanted AT&T declared a monopoly so the elite could turn around and lend money to all of these new companies that would get going because AT&T didn't need them anymore. This is just an idea of how the elite bring about their control factor. 1983, I heard when I was at the meetings in the Bahamas, I heard them talking about something that you didn't hear until just the last year or two. Free trade outsourcing. Those seminars in the Bahamas that I was attending, already back in those days, they were training the young elite to take the industry from America to China and India and Mexico moving it out of this country, taking away your jobs, and already 
in those days, I was hear them talking about free trade, outsourcing, before you ever knew what the business was all about. Why did they want to do this? There's a reason. Oh, I hope this will anger you to no end. The elite knew that they had to take their industry abroad. Why? Well, you just heard from the Wall Street Insider. You, you're going to hear about other uh, facets of how Congress makes money. It all boils down to this. Let's move our factory to China. Now, we'll make our fortune there in China. Then what do we do with that? If we bring it back into America, it falls under the rules of, well, you know the story. So they don't do it. Where do they take that? This was one of the things that was so fascinating in these seminars that I attended. Where do the elite take their money? Well, they moved industry abroad intentionally. Oh, I know they could produce it cheaper in China than they can in America, but what's the real reason behind it all? It's again, a matter of control, control of the funds that they were making out there. And where do they put it? Now, if you are super wealthy, you take your money to Liechtenstein. You probably never heard that name. Uh, if you are a little bit less than super wealthy, you take your money to the Isle of Man. And all this was taught in these seminars where you take your money according to how many millions or billions that you might have. If you are a little less down the line than Liechtenstein and the Isle of Man, you take it to Belize and you hide it away. And then if you are in the $100,000 range up to a million dollar range, you go to the Turks Islands or well, then you could go to the Cayman Islands if you're 100 to 200,000 or maybe a million. And it all de was determined by how wealthy you were as to where you hid your money outside of the United States of America. And industry knew if they moved their plants abroad that their super wealthy could become super wealthier by making their wealth there. And the young elite were being taught this way back in those days. You ask about the lifestyle of the young elite or the elite themselves. They're human. Now, I know they think they're God, but they're really only human. And as a result, uh, you, you can see why the the government officials and others fall for the things that the elite are telling them. The Federal Reserve was produced for the, for the sake of the elite. The World Bank and the IMF manage money according to the way that the elite want them to. And of course, you know who the two biggest elitists in the country are. How do they dress? Well, we'll get down to the nitty gritty of the elite. Not shabby. I don't think I ever saw an elite dressed just haphazardly. I, I would use one expression if I could, and you and I need to know this expression also. Look the part. Whatever you want to be, look that part. In fact, my family, my wife, my son, and I, when we travel on aircraft, we always dress in a suit with, with a shirt and tie. Uh, we dress, why? We've never failed to get good service. Dress the part. Look the part. Whatever you want to be, look that way. The elite, that's exactly the way they look, the way they act. Very professional. I never saw one drunk. I very seldom ever saw one smoke a cigarette. There are some things about the elite that you'll find very interesting. And I hope these simple things about the elite will help you. I learned them as they taught them to me. And I think they can be of help to you. Let me begin with what I saw in those seminars out in the Bahamas and what I heard. The younger elite are chosen. Uh, Mr. Clinton was chosen very early in life. Uh, people that you see in Washington and hear their names right now. Uh, these people 
are chosen from their college years and younger, and they are taught in these seminars and classes how to enslave the masses. I hope you caught that word. You heard me correctly. They are taught how to enslave the masses. Let me try to explain. I learned many things about the elite. And one of the first things I learned was to listen to their buzzwords. Probably the next most important thing, and by the way, let me pause here long enough to say, any movie that comes out of Hollywood, uh, any uh, uh, liberal news media, any program that I might watch on any given afternoon, I can pick out buzzwords. I have tuned my mind and my ear over 35 years uh, to listening to what these people have to say. And things that the average person would probably never pick up on, immediately they stand out in my mind. The elite, the second thing I learned, most important thing about the elite, they have a code of ethics. <laughs> now, I know this sounds strange, and especially when it's coming from a man who's been a minister of the gospel for 55 years. But the elite do have a code of ethics. Now, their code of ethics is quite different than your code of ethics and my code of ethics. My code of ethics is the Word of God, the Bible. My Savior is Jesus Christ. And everything that I do in life revolves around obedience to the Word of God, if at all possible. And I have to overcome the flesh, as everyone else does, in order to do that. But the elite have a code of ethics also. Their code of ethics, one of the facets of their code of ethics is, they must tell you everything they're going to do before they do it. You heard me correctly. They will tell you through a Hollywood movie. They will tell you through buzzwords. They will tell you through expressions that you may hear on the national media. But if you know how to tune your ear to listen to what the elite are saying, you will know everything that's going to take place tomorrow, a week from now, a month from now, a year from now. If you know how to listen to what they're telling you. Many of you remember years ago, George Herbert Bush. Uh, remember, he had been the head of the CIA, and then he was sent as ambassador to China. And then he came back to America and was vice president under Mr. Reagan. And then he became the president of the United States of America. And he coined an expression later entitled, New World Order. Did I understand what he was saying back then? No. I do today, <laughs> you do too, because it is influencing your life. Did he know what he was saying? Did his elitist friends know what he was telling them? You better believe it. They knew 10 years and 20 years down the line. He used to use another expression entitled, thousand points of light. Did that mean anything to you? Didn't to me. Does it today? You better believe it. The elite must tell you what they're going to do before they do it. Now, let me give you an everyday one that maybe you've thought of and maybe you've never thought about. Social security. Did you catch it? They did. In fact, when the social security system was put in by Franklin Delano Roosevelt, did he know what he was doing? He was the first socialist president of the United States of America. Did he know what social security was? Come on now, what is socialism? Socialism is the exact opposite of freedom. Socialism is, is, your, is your formation of, of a socialistic communistic system. Is America a socialistic country? No. We are a constitutional republic, and we, the people, tell the government what to do. The government doesn't tell us what to do. We are supposed to be telling the government what to do. Now, what, did, what, what word did they use there? They were telling you, and they were telling me, 
many, many years ago where they were headed, did anybody pick up on it? Oh, we fell for it, didn't we? Well, you might have. I didn't. No, I won't be their slave. You see, I learned something out there in those seminars in the Bahamas. Their young elitist in training are taught to make slaves out of you and me. And they know what they're doing. It is not done by chance. It's done by design. And everything that's happening today is being done by their hand-trained elitist who went to seminars such as I was allowed to go to. Oh, sure. You should have seen those places where we were. Beautiful private beaches where they could play with their girlfriends. The most marvelous foods you could imagine just caught out of the ocean. Everything was upbeat, rich. They trained them well as to what lifestyle they should live and how they should live that lifestyle while you and the taxpayers paid for it. They knew exactly what they were doing. I didn't fall for their line when I heard Social Security. I'm going to admit to you, I am 76 years of age now. I have never accepted a Social Security check. I have never gotten a penny from the federal government that I didn't send them the check back. You heard me correctly. I have gotten some checks from the government. I sent them every one back, signed with a note saying, keep your dirty, filthy paper. I'm free. I'm we the people. I'll tell you what to do. You're not going to socialize me. I've never accepted a penny from Social Security. I've never accepted a penny from Medicare or Medicaid. I'll take care of and the Lord will take care of me, and He'll take care of you too. And if you will, uh, folks, you must not allow yourself to be enslaved by the elite. They have been taught the methods of enslavement. I know. I sat and listened to them train their young elitist. I want to give you another expression. Social studies. Oh, your children brought home their social studies book from the classroom, didn't they? Did you catch it? Now, I'm training you in the buzzwords of the elite right now. I hope you understand what I'm doing. I'm trying to help you think. Social studies. What was it years ago when I was a boy and I was in school, what did they call it? They called it history. What is it today? It's social studies. Did you get it? The elite were telling you something. Did it register? They want you to be one world. No more United States of America. No more Constitution. No more Republic. You, you can't be independent anymore. You've got to fall into line with the new world order and the United Nations. And don't you dare try to be we the people anymore. We're going to make you we the sheeple. Well, I have a word for them. I have no intentions in being a sheep in the hands of the elite. I learned their thought patterns and their ways early in life. And when they put in social studies in school, I said, oh, people, I hope you understand what they've done to you. And they told you what they were doing. Did you get it? They changed the word from history to social studies, socialism. The elite wrote the textbooks, and they're training your children in the public schools. I homeschooled my children. I taught them the difference between socialism and social studies and true history. Are you getting the words? Are you understanding what they're doing to you? The first communist president of the United States of America was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Social security. Social 
programs of every type. The elite are taking away your constitutional republic. And in its place, they've given you a democracy. You ask any politician today, what form of government is the United States of America? What does he say? A democracy. I asked one the other day, or I should say a while back in a public meeting where I was, and right here, right from our state, and I said, what form of government do we have? And he said, a democracy. No, you don't have a democracy in the United States of America. You find anywhere in the Constitution of the United States of America that ever says we're a democracy. Read Article 4, Section 4 of the Constitution, and you'll find out that it says every, that the federal government may guarantee, must guarantee to every state in this union a republican form of government. They have taken away your republic. They've given you a democracy, and it was done beginning many, many years ago. The, the elite have taken away your currency. I hope you realize what they've done to you. You don't have a quarter anymore. You have a phony piece of metal. What was a quarter? It was one-fourth of a dollar. What was a dollar? One ounce of silver. What have they given you today? A funny piece of phony metal that you look around the outside and you see a circle didn't you get the message when they put that piece of phony stuff out there? Did, did it not register with you that they had taken away your silver from your quarter, from your half dollar, and then you couldn't go to the bank and get the silver dollar anymore? Why? They had to take away the value. And they had to give you a piece of paper in exchange. A piece of paper? What good's that paper? It doesn't even have redeemable anymore by silver and gold. Now it's no more than a Federal Reserve note. And what is the Federal Reserve? It's not any of the agency of the government of the United States of America. It is a private corporation that has literally taken over our currency in this country. The elite have taken away your God. Yes, you heard me correctly. They had to. You've heard me tell this before on radio shows and in other DVD presentations I've made. But they have a plan to remove the God who made America great. And the only way that they could bring in their new world order was to remove the God that had made America great from our society. They took the Ten Commandments off of the courthouse steps. They removed the Bible from the classroom. They had to remove righteousness and God from our society before they could bring in their new world order. So, you would say, well, wait a minute now, chaplain. You say that the elite are trained to make us slaves? We're not slaves, you say. Oh, yes, you are. You're already a slave, and you don't know it. Let me prove it to you. 48% of all Americans receive some form of money from the United States government every month. You say you're not a slave? <laughs> the people in Greece thought they weren't a slave either. But you see what's happening over there. Uh, you say, well, wait a minute. Uh, wh what are you talking about? You're a farmer? They give you a farm subsidy. What is it? It's a form of enslavement. It's a way of bribery. It's a method of the elite doing what they want to do with you. Food stamps? Oh, but you, wait, wait a minute. I, I deserve those. No, you don't. Uh, it, it is a method of enslavement. You say, well, welfare, uh, social security, uh, or maybe you get a paycheck because you work for the government, federal or state. Medicare, Medicaid, 48% of all people in the United States of America receive some sort of check or payment from the United States government on any given month. 
Now we come around to voting in November. How are you going to vote? Ah, I've got to vote for the president that's going to make sure I get my food stamps and my welfare and my social security. And whoever says I'm going to get my hand out from the government, you say you're on a slave? You see, all of this was taught. The younger elite are taught one thing. How to enslave you. Now, I'm going to coin a word here. The name of the game is control. I, I want to take the word control and deal with it for a moment, if I may. One of the things that I remember learning in those seminars that I attended out in the Bahamas, and one thing that I learned from the elite when I lived with them is control everything on nothing. Uh, now, let me try, if I can, to explain somewhat. And then I'll come down to the punchline. And then you'll say, oh my goodness, all of a sudden a light turned on. And I'm beginning to see it. The elite are told and taught that they shouldn't even own the coat on their back. But control it. Now, now, catch my words, please, very carefully. In those seminars, the young elite were taught not to own their house, but to live in it. And, and I know all of this is going to, much, so much of it is going to be brand new to you. I remember one day, I was with a certain attorney friend of mine. He was close enough friend that I could be very personal with him. And he wasn't charging me by the minute or by the hour. We were just chatting. And I mentioned some of the things that I had learned in those seminars out in the Bahamas. And I said, uh, do you do these things? Do you use this? Do you use this? And I named, I'll name them in a moment. And I named some of these things. And he sat there and he wouldn't answer me. And I said, does your Congress friend know about this? And he wouldn't answer me. Uh, I even asked a judge one time about some of these things, and he wouldn't answer me. So this attorney friend, finally when I got through going over a number of things and asking questions, and he refused to answer, he looked square at me, and I'll never forget, it was kind of a puzzled look on his face. And he said, Chaplain, how do you know all this? And I told him where I learned it when I lived with the elite. And then I said, okay, now, be honest with me. Do you know about these things? Yeah. I said, do you use these things? Yeah. I said, do you own your airplane? No. Do you fly in it? Yeah. Do you own your house? No. Will your children pay any inheritance tax when you die? No. Folks, you must understand how the elite think. They have been taught to think in terms of the laws that they have written for the enslavement of you. The laws are made for the elite. What Congress passes is for their benefit. Their attorneys write the laws. The congressmen never read them. And if some of the congressmen don't want to pass the bills because, vote for the bills because they're afraid that you, their constituents, will find out about it, the elite have a way, which I'll tell you about in a moment or two, of stepping in and getting them to vote for that bill. Let me go back again to the word control. The elite, the younger elite are taught, and I heard them explain it in detail in these seminars, and I heard it from the elite themselves when I lived with them. They're taught never to own the coat on their back. Never own their house, never own their automobile, never own their penthouse. 
where their business is, never own their yacht, and never own their jet aircraft. And this one, I almost hesitate, but I have to give it. I've waited 35 years to never have any income. Did you hear that? They fly in that jet, but they don't own it. They drive that automobile, but it's owned in a trust, or their company supplies it to them. So when it comes down to the end, here it is. You've heard it. You've heard it all over the news lately. Tax the rich. Wall Street protest. It, I, I look at what's happening in the country and I say, if only you knew what I know. If you had the slightest idea what the elite well, here it goes. The elite are not the slightest worried about a bill being passed to tax the rich. <laughs> They're sitting back laughing at you. Why? They don't have anything to be taxed. Oh, you see, I never thought about that. They don't own that jet. They don't own that automobile. They don't own that penthouse. They just put that coat on every morning. They don't own it. They are taught to control everything and own nothing. And they're taught how to do it. I know. I attended their seminars. I heard what they were teaching the younger elite. They know what they're doing. They know the control factors. What do they use? I'll just name a few of them for you. I named them off to that attorney that day. And he, he, he wouldn't admit it. Wouldn't say a thing. The elite are taught how to use trusts. How to use contractual companies. How to use blind trust. How to use family trust. They're taught how to use all of the loopholes that are out there for their use. They know the intricate sides of this. But yet you will go to a nine to five job every day. And wonder why you can't make it. But the elite sit there. And they've passed all the laws that they need to be able to live their lifestyle. While you wonder how you're going to make it since the Federal Reserve note is losing much of its purchasing power. The elite are not worried about their children inheriting their fortune. Why? They don't own their fortune. And you wonder, oh, how will I ever leave my child? An inheritance. It's amazing the elite have none of those problems. They saw to it that it was all done and they taught their young people how to do it. They control everything. And that's what they want with you. The name of the game is control. Now, I'm going to meddle for a while. Congress is controlled by the elite. One of the individuals that I asked to appear with me on this DVD series, the reason I ask him is because you have got to know about inside trading. I learned it years ago when I went to those seminars. Illustration. A person is elected to Congress for the first time. They arrive in Washington. They're a Tea Party member. They're all excited. They're going to change the world. 
They hardly get their good, and they are taught the secrets of the elite. And one of those secrets is inside trading. But it's a trap. And I'd like to explain why. I chose a person to deal with the subject of inside trading in this seminar. I, it, it may be difficult for you. You may have to listen to it two or three times. You, you may have to go back and replay that section of the DVD three and four times. But you've got to get it, people, if you don't want to be a slave to the elite. And if you want to warn your Congress people that you're sending off to Washington, your Tea Party members and others, if, if you want to let them know, give them this DVD and tell them what they're going to face when they get there. They'll come home and admit to you that that's the first thing that happened. One of their senior congressional members will come around and say, have you heard about inside trading? Now, next week, j j just say for instance, next week, there's going to be a bill passed. And it'll be for a certain company. And if you go and buy that company's stocks right now, uh, we're going to see to it that this bill is passed so that this solar panel company will have millions and millions of dollars that they can begin to work with. And their stock is going to go right through the roof in the next six months because we've made available to them all these millions of dollars. Now, if you will go and buy that stock right now, before the bill passes, uh, you can make a million. And we'll tell you how to put that million in the Cayman Islands so that you don't have to show it to your constituents when you go home. Ah, you say, yeah, uh, okay. So you fall for the line. Everybody does. You're human. In no way you're going to keep on turning it down after it's offered to you day after day after day after day. Okay, and all of a sudden you realize, well, I, I did. I, I bought an honest stock. Yeah, you didn't do anything wrong. And you kept it for six months and you sold it. That's perfectly honest. You can sell a stock. And now... I have been shown how to put that in the Cayman Islands or the Turks and the Caicos. I hope you're getting some words here, folks. You, you, you might not have heard of the Turks Islands before in the Caicos Islands. Maybe you don't know much about the Caymans. And so you put it there. And you say, this will pay for my child's education in style at Harvard or Yale. I'm justified in doing it. Now, next month, there is a bill that's going to be passed that the elite want, like they wanted the health care bill. All your constituents were against it, Nellie. Americans flooded Washington saying, don't you vote for that bill. And your senior congressman comes around and says, do you remember how I suggested to you that you should buy that stock and sell that stock? And, you know, we've helped you out and we, we, we've tried to make life a little easier for you and your family. Uh, don't you think, even though your constituents are against it, that you, you better vote for this bill? Now, after you've been in Washington for two or three terms, uh, you have made so many millions, and, and you've fallen for their line so many times, you don't have any choice. Have you wondered why the Patriot Act got passed? Just turn that off. You remember when... We made you a million, made you two million, made you five million. Do you remember you came in here a, a, a middle class American Tea Party member, or Democrat, or Republican, and, and you know, you're getting along pretty good now. 
Uh, we need your vote on the Patriot Bill, even though you know it's going to enslave the American people. Or the, pay, or, or, or the health care bill. You getting it? New congressional arrivals. They're taught this. I talked to one here some years ago that happened to be in one of my meetings. And he heard me say these things and he said, Chaplain, you're exactly right. We'd hardly gotten to Congress good and we heard about them talking about all of these things. Now, I'll never forget it. A number of years ago, I was on the phone with one of my elitist friends. I can name him. He's gone on to eternity now. He died about a year ago. His name is Mr. Ken Fromm. Many of you wondered for years if I really had friends in high circles, and then finally I was able to give you some names. I remember one day, by the way, I just stayed in passing. Uh, Mr. Fromm, whom I knew back at Prudhoe Bay years ago, when he passed away, he knew Christ as his Savior. I'll never forget talking with his son on the phone just before he died. And I'd had a number of conversations with the family members. And his son said to me, Chaplain, you don't have a thing to worry about. You'll see Dad in heaven. <coughs> he said, there's no question but that he knows Christ is his Savior. So take heart in knowing that some of the elite are going to see you up there, if you're going to be there also. I remember I was on the phone with him one day, and <coughs> you'll forgive me. I was on the phone with him one day, and we were talking about general things, and uh, I said, I understand that there's something about health care in America. It's going to come before Congress before long. And he said, yes, chaplain, a health care bill. And I said, uh, now, uh, there are some of the elite who know everything that goes on behind closed doors. They know everything that's going to happen a month and a year from now. And he already knew about this. And he said to me, he said, chaplain, that is not a health care bill. And I said, what? I said, this is labeled to the Americans as health care. He said, chaplain, what you're going to see present before Congress shortly. He knew about it. They wrote it. The elite of the world wrote this bill. The president never read it before he signed it. Not a single congressman read the 3,000 pages of the health care bill before they signed it. Not one. But I know somebody who did. The elite had read it from cover to cover. They knew everything that was in it. Their attorneys had worded it precisely as they wanted it. And they presented it before Congress. And they had to work hard to get votes. By reminding congressmen, oh, you remember when we helped you make 500000 or a million? And we told you how to do something with it. Then you better vote our way. And so I said, okay, <clears throat> if this is not a health care bill, what is it? He said, chaplain, this is total control of the American people. This is the exact words. He said, chaplain, this is total control of the American people. The health care bill is not a health care bill. The health care bill is the ultimate of control of the American population. <clears throat> the Patriot Act. It's the same way. The Patriot Act and the health care bill put together brought about 
the ability for the elite to bring in the new world order. Well, let me go abroad, if I may. The elite control Greece. I was with a financial advisor recently, and <clears throat> I said, why would anybody in their right mind buy any Greek paper, Greek bonds? And he said to me, Chaplain, you don't understand. He said, that's what it's all about. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? He said, the elite are buying the Greek paper that's worthless, and they're buying it with worthless paper. And I said, <clears throat> why do they want them? He said, Chaplain, that's what I mean. You see, when the elite finally are ready to do what they're going to do in the world and letting the financial system collapse, <clears throat> he said, they want every nation on the face of the earth, they want every state in America, they want every country in the world, they want every city in America, they want every county in America to be so in debt that they can step in and say, you don't have any choice. The elite are creating debt intentionally while they prolong the collapse down the road and I've been trying my best to tell people this. The elite are going to let the collapse take place when they want it, but they aren't going to let it take place. And he said, whenever the elite uh, finally decide to allow the financial collapse to take place, they can step in, for instance, to Greece and say, Greece, you don't have any choice. <clears throat> Your paper's worthless. We own you. Do you see why the elite are buying the bonds? They'll own the country. And they say, you must accept our new currency. You'll have to take our new world order. Now, that's not only true of Greece. The elite control America. Why do you think that there seems to be no restraints on the national debt? Another trillion and a half, two trillion. On and on we go. Why don't they care? Does it not matter that we are up into the trillions and trillions? No. It doesn't matter one bit, and every person in Congress knows it will never be paid back. The elite want that debt to grow to the trillions and the multi-trillions and the mega-trillions, and when they finally get to the place, they're ready to allow the collapse, and they could. With derivatives, they could bring about that collapse tomorrow morning, or maybe even tonight. And all they'd have to do is pull the plug on the derivative market. And that's the reason I chose someone to give the subject of derivatives in this presentation, because you've got to know what they are. You probably never even heard the word. I didn't even have a good definition up until a few months ago. Whenever the elite are ready for the plug to be pulled, they can step in and say, never mind your constitution. Your dollar is already dead. You've got to accept our new world order. You don't have any choice. Your children are crying. They're hungry. We have the answer. They control the Muslim Brotherhood. Egypt, Mubarak, they took him out so they could put the Muslim Brotherhood in. And they're the ones that control the Muslim Brotherhood and support them. Gaddafi in Libya. Now, Mubarak and Gaddafi both were our, our allies, and they kept things stable in the Middle East. What do we have today? A Muslim Brotherhood controlled by the elite. They control America through the executive orders. They control churches for, through 501c3 organizational status. Mr. Rothschild once was quoted as saying, Allow me to control the currency of a nation, and I care not who makes its laws. Through the Federal Reserve, they control our currency. The currency of the elite, I must give this before I close. I was on the phone with one of my elite friends one day, and I became exasperated. I must admit to you, I was at my wit's end. He told me about this bill before Congress, and that bill before Congress, and this thing, 
and that thing that was going to happen. I think he was telling me out of respect for the fact that I'd given three years of my life to be their chaplain, and he was trying to help me make preparation for my own family and my own welfare. In fact, he'd, he had even advised some things. I won't go into that. And I said, okay, what can I do? He said, chaplain, do you know what our currency is? And I said, no, I don't. He said, our currency is gold and silver. And he said, there's only one thing that you can do in order to maintain your purchasing power. He said, the dollar is gone. He said, the day that the Federal Reserve begins to buy its own paper, the dollar's done with. He said, the only way you're going to maintain purchasing power is our currency. And I said, your currency is gold and silver? Yes. Less than 2% of Americans own gold coins. Less than 1% of Americans own gold coins minted by the United States Mint. Less than one half of a percent of Americans own one ounce gold coins minted prior to 1933. Oh, folks, this is so important. Please, you much catch this. If you are going to purchase the currency of the elite, you need to purchase gold coins minted by the United States Mint. Don't buy foreign coins. They are not legal tender in the United States of America. You are going to need American coins minted by the United States Mint, and please buy coins minted prior to 1933. Why? By law, coins minted by the United States Mint prior to 1933 and silver coins with any date on them, whether it be past or present, cannot be confiscated by the United States government if they ever decide to confiscate gold again as they did many years ago. Did you know that? Buy gold coins minted prior to 1933 and nothing but coins minted by the United States Mint that are legal tender and four states in the United States of America have already passed laws saying that the grocery store, the hardware store, and the drug store must accept gold coins and silver coins minted by the United States Mint as legal tender for payment of debt. Four states have already passed that. Now, they haven't found out how to do it yet. They haven't found a way to implement it. They will. All the refined... Now, now please, think of this mentally. All of the refined gold in the world could be put into a cube 60 feet by 60 feet by 60 feet. Why does it have value that paper doesn't have? If it is written on a piece of paper, it's worth the paper it's written on. One of my elitist friends said that to me one day, and I pass it on to you as some of the best advice I can give. Gold in the year 2000 was $273.60. By 2005, gold was worth, a one ounce gold coin was worth $518.90. By 2009, that same gold coin was worth $1,096.50. By the end of 2011, that same gold coin was worth $1,566.80. There will be food on the grocery store shelves. I know this disagrees somewhat with some of my survivalist friends. There will, please, I'm trying my best, people, to help you understand what the elite have said. There will be plenty of food on the grocery store shelves, plenty of food and water. The shelves aren't going to be empty. 
As one of them said to me, Chaplain, if the crop fails in Florida, we're just bringing it in from another country. If we have a crop failure in California, we can bring it in from our New World Order friends somewhere else. There is not going to be a shortage of food and water on the grocery store shelves, but you may go hungry. Doesn't make any sense, does it? Yes, it does. Why? Because you, your currency, is going to devalue to the point with the trillions of dollars of national debt we have, your currency is going to devalue to the point that you take a wheelbarrow load of Federal Reserve notes to the grocery store to buy a loaf of bread, the grocery stores will have the bread, and the grocery store shelves will be full, but you may go hungry and your children may cry for lack of food because your currency, it has already been planned to devalue it to that point. The name of the game is control. You've got to learn their mindset. Think like the elite, and you can overcome the new world order. Please call the professionals that you'll see on this DVD. They know the issues. That's the reason I've asked them to be on this DVD series. They don't think like the average professional out there. I was in California a number of years ago. Spoke to a group of people, I think it was a few hundred there, it was a caucus for the Republican Party. And after the meeting, a very well-dressed, attractive, middle-aged lady walked up to me and said, Chaplain, I'd like to speak with you after most of the crowd has moved out and you have a few minutes. I said, I'd be glad to. After I noticed most everyone had moved out of the building, I went back and sat down in the auditorium. And this lady said, Chaplain, I'm Mrs. So-and-so. I'll not mention her name. You will know who she is. And she said, I am the chairman of the Republican Party of California who introduced Ronald Reagan to the Republican Party, whereby he became president of the United States of America. I said, congratulations. We have not had a single president of the United States of America since Ronald Reagan that has not been an elitist. Did you hear me? Ronald Reagan was not one. Oh no, now, just wait till you hear the story. The lady said, Chaplain, I was at the hotel that night when Ronald Reagan was to choose his vice presidential running candidate. She said, I was there with them. And she said, Ronald Reagan came to us personally, his close friends, and said, I promise you, I will not choose an elitist as my vice, vice presidential running candidate. And he said, I know that George Herbert Bush is one and I know Mr. Kissinger is one, and he said, I promise you, I will not choose them as my vice presidential running candidate. He chose Bush. He came to this lady the next day, who was the one that introduced him to the Republican Party, and he said, I'm going to have to apologize. He said, I'm very sorry. He said, Bush was there, Kissinger was there, he named a few other people in the room, and I was there. And he said, I was told that either I chose Mr. Bush as my vice presidential running candidate, or they would smear me with the media all over this nation and guaranteed me I would never become the president of the United States of America. And he said, I had to make a choice, either to accept Mr. Bush, whom I knew is an elitist, or to become the president and try to help America. I had a choice and I had no choice. And he said, I knew they could do it. And he said, I chose Mr. Bush so that I could help America for eight years. I was watching the morning news a while back. I very seldom ever watch the morning news. And who do you think I saw? Now, I, this happened personally. And who was being interviewed? Daddy Bush. 
And finally, they came to the end of the interview, and the person said, Mr. Bush, I need to ask you one last question. Do you ever watch the morning news? Mr. Bush spoke up and said, no. You know how you can do it. <laughs> you know, he's a very curt person anyway. He said, no, I never watch the morning news. Well, the newscaster was really taken back a step. She had to hesitate for a moment, and finally she said, well, Mr. Bush, why don't you watch the morning news? And he said, because I already know what it's going to be. Prepare to meet thy God, humanity. Prepare to meet the God of the Bible. And what does the Bible say? Now, this is not Lindsay Williams talking. I'm going to quote, and I will give you where the chapter and verse is. I'm going to quote from God's holy word, the Bible. The creator of all heaven and earth, Yahweh in the Hebrew language. I'm going to quote his word, which has always been right. George Washington depended on it. All of our founding fathers depended on it. They went to it for the writing of the Constitution of the United States of America. Rodney just showed you what every nation has gone from to. Proverbs in the Old Testament, chapter 14 and verse 34 says, Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. I was amazed at 9-11 we saw no repentance in the United States of America. I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. How could people not realize that judgment, something had happened. Somebody was attacking us. Something was taking place that had never happened in this wonderful country before. The world looked up to us. What's taking place? Jesus said in the New Testament in Luke, chapter 5 and verse 32, And Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, if you think you're righteous, the rest of what I have to say probably won't have anything to do with you. I'll never forget one year when I was a pastor in Florida. We had a youth evangelist that came to our church. And oh, did we have a marvelous youth meeting. We probably had dozens of young people that placed their profession of faith in Jesus Christ and believed God's word. But there was one little boy that walked down the aisle one day and when the youth evangelist was dealing with him, he said, but I'm not a sinner. He said, my mom and daddy told me I am not a sinner. And he said, you said that gen sinners need to come to Jesus and have their sins forgiven. And that by believing on Jesus as your Savior, that you can be redeemed from sin and have new life in Christ. But he said, my mom and daddy told me I'm not a sinner. And the youth evangelist came to me. And he said, Pastor, I don't know what to do. This, this young man doesn't need Jesus. <laughs> he, he said, he's not a sinner. He said, his mom and daddy told him he's not a sinner. Well, he doesn't need Jesus. What can I do? I said, you can't do anything. Because I said, the reason that people need to be redeemed is because of original sin and if you're not willing to believe that you're a sinner, you don't need Jesus. It's just that simple. But if you will believe God's Word and what God's Word says about it, then you'll have to admit, we as a nation have sinned. We as a people have sinned. But just so that you'll know what the Bible says, and I think God's a little bit wiser than I am. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by grace through repentance that is in Christ Jesus. Please. 
Will you humble yourself, admit who you are, realize what condition you're in? You're going to face God someday. So may I go a little further, just in case you are willing to admit the condition of the people and the nation. And this one I'm sure you recognize, I'm sure you've heard it somewhere down the line. It's found in John chapter 3. And I'm going to begin with verse 15, that whosoever believeth in him, speaking of Jesus Christ, should not perish. You'll perish without Jesus. Oh, I know. Foggy old preacher. I think I'll just cut off the DVD. Go, ball, go ahead if you'd like. You'll cut it back on someday. Whenever you face God, if you haven't cut it on before then, you'll find it out for yourself. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And the favorite verse of Christians everywhere, for God, Yahweh, in the Jewish language, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, Jesus, Yeshua, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent his Son into the world, for God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world. Jesus didn't come here to condemn you, and I don't condemn you either. I'm here telling you what I'm telling you because I want to help you. And the only way you can have help is if you'll accept it. Accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior. And when you accept His sacrifice for your sin, someone had to pay for your sin. Somebody had to pay for it. You can't pay for it. Joining a church won't get it for you. You can't buy it. You might be a billionaire or a trillionaire. You can't buy it if you tried. First of all, you can't find God to give him the billion. And even if you could, he wouldn't accept Federal Reserve notes. So how are you going to get it? So simple. Belief. You see, God had to make it simple. Or Lindsay Williams, at, at 11 years of age, would have never found it. Thank the Lord for a godly grandmother. Read the Bible every day. Took me to church every Sunday. Told me about Jesus when I was 11 years of age and I trusted him. And I've never regretted it from that day until this. And I'm 75. And I'm looking forward to seeing him. You can too. For God sent not his Son into the world, condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Well, Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, neither, oh, please, this is so important. It leaves out a lot of people, leaves out a lot of religious leaders, by the way. God's holy word says, Lindsay Williams didn't say this, God's holy word says it, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given amongst men whereby ye must be saved. It didn't say hope you might or think you will. It said you must. It's the only way. Regardless of what others may say, God's holy word says it's the only way. There are many deceptions out there. One last scripture and then we'll close out. I hope you're still viewing. hope you haven't cut off that DVD yet. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 9. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. May I again go back to those words, that not of yourself. Do you realize that you nor I, neither one, have the grace that comes from God? You and I neither have the one, neither of us, you or I, neither one have faith. 
The Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. When you read the Word of God, you get faith. Go read it. You'll get faith. You, grace, where does it come from? It's a gift of God. And so it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Do you realize? A good thing to do to join a church, yeah, but it's not going to get you salvation. Good thing to do to give to the church. What, what you put in the collection plate, want them out to a hill of beans? If it doesn't, if it's not backed up by faith and grace, there's only one way. He will give you the grace and He will give you the faith and all you have to do is believe. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth, He makes it so simple that you might stumble over it if you're not careful. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, 9. Works won't do you a bit of good unless they're backed up by faith and the grace of God. Well, to the best that I have been able to declare it, I have told you what I feel are the most important things. And right now, will you please get on your knees in front of that television set or big screen or TV or how are you watching it? Would you please get on your knees right now? And I'll just give you a simple pattern that you might want to follow. Jesus, I believe what you've said in your word. I believe that I need saving. I believe I can't do it myself. But I believe you'll give me the grace and the faith. And right now, I want to trust Jesus Christ as my Savior. And I'm asking you to save my soul. Thank you. In the name of the Son of God, who redeemed me and set me free, I ask it. Amen. It is my privilege to introduce to you on this DVD, Pastor David Bowen, former Hollywood playwright, and I recommend that you go to his website entitled interpretingthetimes.com daily, please. Pastor David is a leader in his congregation. He's a pastor of his congregation in a way that I wish more pastors would. And, and I say, I've been to his church. And I would recommend every pastor that ever sees this DVD to please do it. He is keeping people informed and helping them to prepare not only for themselves, but preparing them to be a blessing to others. You can contact him through, again, I'll give it to you, his website, and you'll find it on the screen later, interpretingthetimes.com. Pastor David, God bless you. We're glad to have you. Well, Lindsay, thank you for allowing me to be a part of this DVD set. It's, it's very exciting to be here. You have done such a great job in helping people understand the elite and, and what they do and how they control things. You know, as a pastor, I have a, a lot of people who come to me and, and they need help with both relationship issues and with money issues. You know, the average person just does not really understand how money works and, and where do they go to understand that. So well, what you're doing and, and, and being involved with this is very exciting to really understand the aspect of the system. The elite control the system, so how does that system work and how does it affect the average person? You know, I, I remember a little story about the little boy who, he always thought mom, M-O-M, meant made out of money. Well, of course, that's not what mom means. But there's people in America who think that America is made out of money. We just keep printing money and printing money, and that's not how we are either. Uh, very simple question. I ask people, what is money? Define what money is. 
By definition, money is something that is accepted as a, a valued exchange. It's a way of, of making payments. It's a means of making payments. H how much money do we really need? There was a survey done a few years ago, and, and they went to 16 different countries, and they asked just that question, how much money do you need? There was a response that was given that was, that was very common. There was two very common responses. The first one was people just wanted enough money to pay the bills every month and have a little bit left over at the end of the month. They would be completely content if that was the case. They would be thrilled if they had no bills, if they would be out of debt. Now what that survey really tells us is that most people around the world don't have money left over at the end of the month, and they do have debt. When you talk about money, what's the history of money? You know, in the days of old, uh, one was considered wealthy if you had a, a great deal of, of, of crops and livestock, how much, how much produce you had and how many animals you had. That's how wealth was created. Wealth was always in danger, though, when you were that wealthy because the crops could spoil and the livestock could get ill. The first mention of wealth in the Bible goes all the way back to Genesis to Abraham. Abraham was wealthy. He was rich because he had cattle, and he had silver, and he had gold. Back in the days of old in Egypt, common workers were paid with grain. In the Roman times, Roman soldiers were paid with salt. It's interesting, the word salt is how we get our modern word salary. Before there was coins or paper, there was a bartering system. You know, people would, would measure value of something and they would try to barter before they understood what the value of money was. You know, what was desired, what was needed, and what did you have, and what did I have, and what could we exchange? The barter system had some weak areas, though, because how did we understand what the value was? It didn't take long for the silversmith to realize it was in his best interest to take the tools that he made by hand and to give them to the hunters. So the hunters could go out and hunt and bring back food for the silversmith. So the exchange of tools for food was a win-win situation. The barter system was what worked in those days. But again, the problem was, how did you come to a value? If I had a goat, what was that goat worth? If I was a goat owner, it was worth more than to someone who was not a goat owner. How do you get change for a goat if you're going to barter something? What do you do? How do you get started? You see, this is where debt really started, because I may come to you and want your goat, and all I have is a basket of apples. Well, we agree that the basket of apples and a goat is not the same value, so maybe I will bring you a basket of apples every month for a year. And after a year's time, the debt of the goat would be paid up. That promissory agreement was put in place, and debt started. We had to find a way to have common value. If you go back and research the history of money, one could barter with, with metals. It, it came the, the, to a point to where copper and silver and gold were used, and, and that was something people agreed on on a value. And they would take the copper and the silver and the gold, and they, they would make rings and earrings and bracelets. And they would use those items to barter and trade. Then it came to a point to where coins replaced the, the uh, items that were made out of copper and gold. If you go back to the time of Pharaoh, when he put Joseph in place and he gave Joseph some authority, what did he do? He put a ring of gold on Joseph's finger and a gold chain around his neck. But the value of precious metals became more commonplace when coins were used. Now let's fast forward to 2012. Now we have paper money. The United States dollar. If you reach into your, into your pocketbook and you pull out a dollar, you're going to say, or you realize it says a Federal Reserve note on it. Well, what is a Federal Reserve note, and how long have we been using these? You know, if you go back just a, a few decades, back into the 60s, it didn't say Federal Reserve note. It said silver certificate. The Federal Reserve, the, the United States government, stopped printing silver certificates in, in 1964 because at that time, a dollar certificate, silver was worth $1.27. So they had to stop using silver certificates. They stopped redeeming them in June of 1968. The Federal Reserve stopped printing the silver uh, paperwork because you could bring it in anywhere in the world and get a silver coin. It, we started to get out of balance with that, so they had to stop that program. It, when they stopped the program, that kind of led to 1971 and our president, President Nixon. You see, he couldn't print money like we can today back then because it had to be backed by gold. 
We could only print as much money as we had in gold reserves. But in 1971, in August of 71, President Nixon took us off the gold standard, which meant we now had the ability to print money at will, though we promised we wouldn't go crazy with that. Now fast forward from 1971 to today. We're just coming off of the Fed printing money with QE1 and QE2. Maybe you've heard of QE1 and QE2 in the newspapers or on the news. What does that really mean? What does that stand for? The QE is quantitative easing. It's kind of a fancy word. It's a fancy word for just printing money. 40 years ago, we came off the gold standard. Now we're doing QE1 and QE2. QE1 started in November of 2008. It went until March 2010. QE2 started in November of 2010 and went until uh, June of 2011. What was QE1 and what was QE2? What did the Fed do? Well, let's look at the first one. QE1, the Fed, th th what they did, they purchased $500 billion in mortgage-backed securities. See, this is the, the whole real estate bubble. This is what happened when they started buying mortgages. When the government got in that business, QE1, they did five things. The first thing was they backed mortgage securities. They bought $500 billion worth of them. Then they announced that they're going to purchase $100 billion in debt. Whose debt? Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Ginnie Mae. They were buying uh, home loans that the federal government was supporting. They were buying their own debt. The third thing they did is that they, they cut the interest rate to near zero. December, December 16, 2008, about halfway through QE1, they cut the interest rate down to zero. Then in March of 2009, the Fed expanded the mortgage buying program. They, they went out and purchased $750 billion more worth of mortgage-backed securities. And then they agreed to go out and, and buy $100 billion more worth of long-term debt. All they had to do was print the money. We came a long way from silver certificates and from the 1971 coming off the gold standard to printing all kind of money. QE1 and QE2. Now the QE1 program ended with a total of $1.25 trillion in purchases of mortgage-backed securities. Uh, add on top of that another $175 billion of agency debt, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, so on and so forth. Well, what's the effect of all that? See, the common person does not understand how that affects them. When the elite print the money, when they give the approval for this to happen, when the Federal Reserve, which is neither Federal or nor Reserve, when they print the money, what does that do? It devalues it. The more you print, it devalues what you have. You know, a, a wonderful illustration is I, I kind of enjoy baseball ca cards. It's kind of a hobby and I'm, it's kind of fun to do, but you know, this baseball card right here, this is the Hannes Wagner T206. This was put out in, in 1909 to 1911. Now, Hannes Wagner, besides being a very good ball player, he was concerned with this card because on the back, it was put out by a tobacco company. And Hannes Wagner did not want his name associated with tobacco. He didn't want it to have kids thinking it was okay to smoke. So Hannes Wagner said, please remove me from this set. Now, if you were to try to find a, a card, which is 100 years old, from this set, you could do that now. A card would cost you 20, 25, maybe $30, except for the Hannes Wagner card. This card is, is there's about 50 of these in, in existence. If, if you were to go out and try to find one of these, well, there was two recent, recent, recent sales of the Hannes Wagner card. In, in November of 2010, one in very poor condition, a poor condition, it may be you have a crease in it and it might be all, you know, maybe torn and, and ripped up and the corners kind of rounded. A, a card in that condition sold for $220,000. In, in, in 2007, one in mint condition sold for $2.3 million. It's crazy, a piece of cardboard, $2.3 million. Now, what if you went upstairs into the attic and you found grandpa's old trunk and you started going through the trunk and what you found inside the trunk was a Hannes Wagner baseball card in mint condition. What would that be worth? You see, when there's only one of them, it's worth $2.3 million. But when there's two, the value goes down. 
Now what if there was three? Or four? Or five? What if you found ten of those baseball cards? What would the value be? We don't know because they don't exist. But I think you can understand the more you find, the value drops. And the more you print money, the value drops. So getting back to our country and where we're at, how does all this work out for us? Coming off the gold standard, having the ability to just print money as needed, and then going into QE1 and then QE2, how does that work out? We can't maintain this. You know, the, the best way of looking at this is looking at our banking system. If you go back 12 years, how are banks doing? You know, 12 years ago, banks were doing great. In 2000, only two banks failed the entire year. In 2001, four banks failed. In, in 2002, 11 banks failed, and many people believe that was because of what happened on 9-11. In 2004, four banks failed. In 2005 and 6, there were no bank failures. And in 2007, three banks failed. So in three years, 2005, 6, and 7, only three banks failed. In eight years, from 2000 to 2007, only 27 banks failed. And then you have the printing of money, and you have QE1 and QE2. In 2008, 25 banks failed. Remember, that late in that year was the beginning of QE1. In 2009, 140 banks failed. In 2010, 157 banks failed. In just two years, 297 banks had to close. So how well is this working for us? QE1 starts in late 2008. No one is saying it, but the system is failing. We have been warned about this. We, we were giving the warning many, many years ago. In Leviticus, it says, do not use dishonest scales. It says, use honest scales and honest weights. In the book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 25, it says, do not have two different weights in your bag, one heavy and one light. It says, do not have two heavy measures in your home, one large and one small. What does that mean? This would be the, the merchant who was trying to go out and, and buy wheat or grain, a commodity. And he would have a large scale, and he would go out and want to buy 50 pounds of grain. Well, the scale would say 50, but really, it was 60. He would put the weight, he would put the grain on and weigh it out, and he would th the, the one who was selling it to him would think he was selling him 50 pounds of grain, when actually he was selling him 60 pounds. He was stealing 10 pounds. That's unrighteous. Then that merchant would go back to his shop, and uh, the, the ladies would come in and want to buy grain, and he would pull out a smaller scale. And even though it read 50 pounds, it would only be 40. And he would sell the ladies 50 pounds of grain, but it only really was 40 pounds. So in that day, he made two purchases. He, he bought and sold 50 pounds of grain, but in both times, he, he, he robbed them of 10 pounds. It's unrighteous. It was, it was unrighteous scales. The system that we have today is just like that. The scales do not balance. It's unrighteous. Today's system of, of dishonest scales is fractional reserved banking. And the common person does not understand this. Fractional reserve banking is completely legal, but just because it's legal does not mean it's righteous. Fractional, fractional reserve banking makes money out of nothing. It creates debt. It creates debt, not money. Basically what it is, the banks only have to keep a fraction on reserve of what a deposit is. So when you go in and you deposit $1, or you deposit $10, for every $10 you deposit, they have to only keep one. Now what happens if they get $100,000 of deposits? What can they do with that? They can create a million dollars worth of debt. What does creating this debt do? It creates unbalanced scale and it becomes unrighteous. Think about this. You've seen the headlines. Fractional reserve banking devalues the dollar. It causes inflation. It creates a debt bubble that cannot be sustained. It's like blowing up a balloon. You can blow it up and blow it up and blow it up, but at some point you got to stop or it's going to explode. And that's what happens when we have the Federal Reserve printing money and the banks holding only back a fraction. It creates a debt, bu debt, bu a debt bubble. And what happens is borrowers, people, you and I, we just we can't pay our bills because jobs are lost. We have bad debt. 
The bank responds by that, by foreclosing, by confiscating the assets, and it just leads to a crisis. And that crisis can lead to an entire collapse of society. Greece is a perfect example. So for the common person to understand what fractional reserve banking, what unrighteous scales does, for you and I, if we don't have jobs, if unemployment is rising, which it is, if the salaries are going down, which they are, we start cutting back, so retail sales are, are, are affected by that. If, the resale, if, if sales aren't happening in stores, then they're not paying their bills either. And commercial mortgages begin to default. And when the commercial mortgages begin to default, then you lead into states and cities not having enough tax revenue and they can't pay their bills. If you live in New York or Alabama or Illinois or California, you understand this. When states and cities can't pay their bills, how much further behind are nations? Greece, Spain, Italy, Portugal. We see it happening in the news. Please understand, the Federal Reserve prints money to bail out the financial system, not the economy. They are printing money to bail out the system, not to bail out the economy. They're not helping the average person, they're not helping you and I, they are keeping the system which the elite put in place. That's why the money is being printed. What does all this mean? It means don't be afraid. Just be prepared. Listen to the people in the DVD series. Listen as Lindsay explains how the, the elite understand how they work. And just be prepared. You know, it was written many, many years ago, but Psalm 64, King David is praying, and he's praying that the righteous be delivered from the wicked. And it seems like that, that prayer could be 2012. In the Psalm, it says that he says, Dear Lord, protect my life from the threat of the enemy. Hide me from the conspiracy of the wicked, from the plots of evildoers. They sharpen their tongues. Like swords, they aim cruel words. They shoot from ambush at the innocent. They shoot suddenly without fear. They encourage each other in evil plans. They say, who will see? They plot injustice, and they say, we have devised a perfect plan. Doesn't that sound like 2012? The conspiracy of the wicked, the plot of the evildoers. They shoot from ambush at the innocent. They shout, they encourage, they do this without fear. They put together evil plans. And they say, who will see it? They plot injustice. And they say, we have devised a perfect plan. You don't need to be afraid. You just need to be prepared. God bless you. Pastor David Bowen, Interpreting the Times. Oh, please, daily, go to his website. Uh, you'll find new information continuously. If you need to call him, you can call toll free. 888-500-1337 on the web again go daily interpretingthetimes.com I introduce to you a very unique and unusual man whom you'll probably never hear an interview like this again Tom Tala a Wall Street insider this is startling it is a privilege to have Tom Tyler even appear on this DVD. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity to hear what you're going to hear. I welcome to this DVD, Tom Tyler. Well, of course, my heart is that everyday Americans have an opportunity to invest their hard earned money and to be able to succeed in building the types of lives that they desire for their families. I spent 20 years living in Manhattan and working in the securities business down on Wall Street as well as in the commodities industry. And I wish I could tell you that the financial industry provides a level playing field for all investors. It's always said that there's two sides to a trade, the buy and the sell. So when the buyer and the seller 
both execute a transaction and they both believe they benefit from it, it's a fair trade. Unfortunately, I don't think that's the type of transaction that occurs between the American people and the financial system. What I've come to understand about the financial system is that it's a depository for Americans' hard-earned money from which a very financially talented and elite group of people parlay or leverage these funds into great wealth that accrues to their credit. In the next few minutes, I'll talk a little bit about what I mean. But I first want you to understand something that's vital to my role as a money manager and perhaps to yours as an investor. My job is to try to understand the financial system as it exists and then to suggest to clients where their money will be treated best. So it is with due respect that I make no judgments, good or bad, about institutions or groups that I may reference. Uh, sometimes I make references to the powers that be. And um, I don't mean to insinuate that anybody is doing anything illegal. The system is what it is, and understanding it is key to being successful in investing. Now, I, re I remember early in my career, I uh, was a trainee at an investment banking firm off of Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. And this was an initial public offering firm. And I quickly realized that the big swingers in the firm, the top executives, were the ones who had access to the best IPOs. And of course, their clients had access to those IPOs as well. And the rest of us had to settle for the crumbs. I also began to notice that the best IPO shares found their way to the accounts of top politicians, uh, rather to their blind trusts, and nothing illegal about this. As a matter of fact, as I began to notice, there was a pathway between the financial industry and the government. And between the financial industry and the go government was a, uh, an organization called the Fed, the Federal Reserve. Now, for quite some time, the American public has heard again and again that the Fed is here to help us keep unemployment low, keep inflation low, keep monetary policy stable. In other words, to protect the earning, spending, and saving power of the American people through a strong dollar. Now, who does the financial system represent and who benefits the most from this system? Let's map this out. The Federal Reserve was created by the federal government. The federal government appoints the Federal Reserve governors through the nomination of the president and the confirmation of the U.S. Senate. That's a direct pathway between the government and the Fed. Now the Fed regulates the banks and it has the authority to set policies that benefit the banking system. I believe also it's a fair point to make that the financial industry is one of the major contributors to the political system, which writes the laws. So everything that the system wants to be legal is legal. One aspect of the Fed is that they have the authority to make certain decisions and to take various actions without disclosing them. It is fair to say that thus a rather elite group of individuals have an inter interesting influence on actions in the global financial system that we know nothing about. These are just the rules and this is just how the system works. I began to understand this relationship one day years ago as a young stockbroker sitting at my desk in what was at that time called the bullpen. In those days, that was a large room with dozens of stockbrokers seeming to always be frantically speaking on the phone to our clients, peering into what was called a Quotron in those days, which today it's just simply a computer uh, that provides you with stock quotes. And on this one day, a paper was placed on my desk. And with the hindsight of what, is, what has happened through the many years since then, I've always remembered this piece of paper. It was a product that involved the packaging of mortgages together. They were claimed to be AAA rated, and they were destined to be sold throughout the entire world. And there was never a lack of these products that we were encouraged to sell to our clients. 
Many of these products have been created since then. Now, what these products were was that everyday Americans took hard-earned money and they put it down for a mortgage. And the system took these funds and they issued debt or a mortgage obligation. And of course, the mortgage was many times the value of this hard-earned down payment. As a matter of fact, more and more of these mortgages were needed to feed into the financial system. So the government made it more than possible for more people to qualify for these mortgages. As a matter of fact, they prescribed it by law. The Fed got involved by making a very accommodative interest rate policy which kept the cost of these mortgages very low for people to afford. Now while the banks were enthusiastic about underwriting this flush of additional mortgages coming into the system, they knew that the weight and the increased risk of these assets would be too much to hold on their books. So they had to be offloaded. The ball was then handed to Wall Street. And of course, it's an illusion that Wall Street only resides in lower Manhattan. The financial system spans the entire globe to all corners of the earth. So the simple mortgage transaction was then packaged and in a sense sliced and diced, repackaged, leveraged again and repackaged and then sold throughout the entire world. The genius of this money flow is that the products are so sophisticated that very few people are able to understand them and the distribution so extensive that there is almost the inability to even track or to know where these funds reside. Money seems to just disappear. I remember at one point in my career my office uh, was literally located in the shadow of the World Trade Center. And I would remember as I would leave work at night, sometimes I would look up into the World Trade Center, which would seem to just go forever up into the sky. Uh, once in a while, it'd be a little cloudy, and the towers would simply disappear up into the sky. And so sometimes I wondered whether that was where all the money was going to. There are people today who are experiencing difficulties with their mortgages and their houses are being foreclosed on and nobody can locate where their mortgages are. There are institutions today that are on the brink of insolvency and somehow hundreds of millions, millions of dollars are missing and they can't find them. I heard uh, a government report that uh, this missing money was just really sloppy bookkeeping. Well I also read reports that there are everyday Americans who put funds in this institution and they haven't gotten those funds back. I guess in other words, poor bookkeeping isn't paying their rents. Somewhere along the line, the average American taxpayer had been obligated to be a co-signer, not of the wealth that was created by this system, but of the toxic debt, and thus the bailout with taxpayer funds. We are led to believe that the very institutions that created this system and these products and those responsible for managing and regulating these transactions either just had no idea of the financial collapse that could result or they had created a system that they couldn't manage. Well, let me tell you a story that goes back to the 1990s. Uh, a person was appointed to the CFTC, that's the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Uh, they're the uh, organization that uh, regulates and manages uh, the vast uh, commodities and futures markets. Uh, this new um, chairman of the CFTC began to take a look at these emerging products called derivatives and uh, did an analysis on them. In the conclusion that this person reached along with uh, other people at the CFTC was that if certain events unfolded into the future, there was a possibility that these derivatives could cause a massive collapse of the financial system. Well, you can imagine that uh, this person was very interested in letting people know about this. 
And so they went out and started talking to the various government agencies. Remember that pathway. You've got uh, the government, you've got the Fed, you've got the banking system, and then you got back to the, uh, the government again. And so eventually she was invited to a meeting. And this meeting literally had all the leaders of all the members of the financial system. And they brought the, the head of the CFTC in to meet with them and they basically told this person one thing, to be quiet. In other words, they didn't want to hear anything about a possible financial collapse due to the, the derivatives and they didn't want anybody else to hear about it either. Now, if this was a plan, it was a pretty good plan for those who benefited from the system. I'd like to know what you think about this. Key to the system is that it needs your money to create their wealth. For example, the institutional investment complex predominantly suggests to average investors that the best strategy is to buy and hold. In other words, keep your money in the stock market and buy those long-term bonds. Keep adding to your 401k. Keep putting money in your individual retirement accounts. And if you need that money, well, you have to be 60 years old to uh, withdraw it without a penalty. Now, the insurance industry has created many products uh, using many assets, almost every asset that's out there. And if you buy one of these annuity products, again, if you want your money back, you'll get penalized to get your money. Super wealth is created not in the stock market or in the mortgage market. It's not created in the insurance market or in banks. These are the depositories for money. Real wealth is created from money that's in these depositories. If you want to play in the investment markets, you need to learn how to play with the powers that be and not to be played by the system. Well, there's good news. While the money of the powers that be can run and it can hide, it can't disappear. You need to learn to follow that money to be a successful investor. And you, did, and you need to know how to use some of the same methods that the powers that be use to create their super wealth. I want to give you a few ideas about where all this money goes. And while this discussion requires more extensive time than, than we have today, uh, it just really does take a few minutes. Uh, unfortunately, it took me many years to learn this to learn these res uh, revelations about where this money goes and how to follow it. But for many years, I was very imbued in the stock market and in the financial system as, as I understood it then. Just a quick note, though, about the stock and the bond markets before I move on to some other assets. There is a place in these markets for investors. There are times when the powers that be favor these markets. Remember, top, top executives get paid and stock bonuses. And even when retail investors are shying away from these markets during volatile and uncertain economic times, uh, the Fed and the government can support these markets through Fed policies and government policies such as stimulus. Uh, and uh, the corporate community can initiate stock buybacks to support the stock market. You need uh, guidance when you do invest in these markets because you're still swimming with the sharks. Many investors have related to me that as their stock portfolios have declined 30 or 40 percent, their advisors keep them in the market. What I'm going to be discussing uh, in a few minutes are some assets that can serve as a balance to stock and bond investments. In other words, these are assets which perform differently historically from stocks and bonds and thus may provide you with some balance to some of the other assets that you own. Now there's a basic difference between securitized ownership of an asset and what I'm about to discuss. What we've been basically discussing thus far um, are stock certificates, stock or bond certificates. 
This is a stock certificate, and uh, don't be concerned that it's actually Enron corporate, Corporation stock. And you're going to see that there's going to be a dramatic, dramatic change in the texture of the assets that we're about to discuss. Excuse me for just a second. Now, some of you may think that I was just thirsty, and, and I was, but I want to ask you a question. Would you rather own this asset, and a lot of people refer to these as paper assets, or would you rather own this? The most valuable commodity in the world today is water. It is estimated by 2050 that over 2 billion people in this world will lack sufficient water. The powers that be are securing as much possible water as quickly as possible. Nothing grows without it, and water provides actually a majority of the composition of the human body. I'm privileged to do some work in the Middle East, and one of my associates told me there about a wealthy government that initiated a program of growing grain in the desert. And you can actually grow grain in the desert. Uh, once I was flying over the desert, which of course seems to extend forever, and I was peering out the plane window, and out of nowhere, there was a grain field right there. And you don't know where nowhere is until you fly over one of these deserts. But the program by 2008 encountered a devastating problem. And I think you can imagine what it is. There just wasn't enough water in the desert. So this government initiated a program of investing in other countries to grow their food. And they invested in this. I don't know if you can see this. This is what some people may call dirt. Uh, it happens to be grade A uh, North Carolina farmland soil. There is a global rush right now to buy farmland. And super wealth is getting there first. Governments in their sovereign funds are buying and leasing hundreds of millions of acres of productive farmland all over the world. There can be a farm farmland rush in America as well. This requires, though, a shift from the big agribusiness model back to the traditional American system of small farming and local food production. There's an opportunity for people of America in their hard-earned capital to join with farmers to help relieve them from the shackles of the banking system in high loan rates. All across the country, Americans are demonstrating their desire to partner with farmers through co-ops, farmers markets, and an increasing desire for specialized organically farmed foods. There's a place for investments in this movement. Now, one thing that really makes this useless is if you don't have any seeds. Smart investors have figured out that no food grows without seeds. The seed industry is fragmented, which creates opportunities for these with vision and persistence. I believe that there, is, there are seed products in markets that have yet to be developed that will serve healthy consumer preference rather than big agribusiness convenience and profit. I want to ask you another question. Again, pulling out my stock certificate. Would you rather own this or this? This is motor oil. I'm sure that you have noticed that we live in a world that requires constant movement. We move from here to there, and uh, products and materials move from here to there. Petrochemicals and their derivatives power this movement. And they also provide either heat for our bodies, and I guess this is necessary if you live in Alaska, and of course uh, cooling that is needed here in Arizona. And as much as one might support alternative energy sources, and yes, the genius of American uh, innovation is working to develop them, super wealth directly owns those energy sources that today and tomorrow move, heat, cool, and illuminates life. 
Now, because I'm discussing commodities, I want to mention the futures market and its role in protecting or hedging valuable assets. You remember earlier that I mentioned that you need to learn how to use some of the methods of the super wealth. Savvy investors have learned that it's as important to protect assets as to grow them. And the futures markets provides just this through hedging, the protection of assets. I believe that the futures market is one of the most underutilized tools that Americans uh, have available to, to them to protect, their, to protect their assets, especially the family budget and small business budgets. In other words, food costs rise, as do energy prices, gasoline, and materials, and they put a strain on family and small business budgets. And hedging through the futures markets is a way to help to mitigate the risks and the costs of these rising prices. And to some degree, securities portfolios can also use commodity ETFs to hedge small business and family budgets. Now, people were created to need three things physically. One is food, the other is water, and the third thing is shelter. In other words, people can't live outside and be exposed. Investing in income-producing single-family homes is one of the best opportunities today with the low housing prices and the low interest rates and also the high rents. Single-family homes that are producing income can generate a cash return that is better than most fixed income assets. One of the wealthiest billionaires on earth commented, quote, if you had a way of buying a couple hundred thousand single-family homes and had a way of managing them, I would, end quote. Remember, follow the money. I don't know if you can, can see this right here, but uh, this is a uh, gold coin. Because everything that glitters is gold. My partner and I began recommending to clients uh, early last decade uh, to um, consider investing in gold. And at that time, gold had just risen from a little bit below $300 a share and up to a little bit over $400 a share. And we were wondering whether we were too late. Well, of course, that's uh, certainly not been the case. Uh, many investors today are finding that gold ETFs are one way in the securities portfolios uh, to have a representation of gold ownership and, of course, the appreciation that gold has provided uh, to investors over uh, this past decade and many years before that. Unfortunately, though, gold ETFs uh, don't really give you the physical representation and ownership of gold uh, that uh, is also, I believe, of value. Uh, so many people are buying the physical gold and holding it themselves. There is also an option to buy physical gold and deposit it with a company that will store it and, en and enable you to manage it through an investment account. While gold has appreciated over the past number of years, there still can be a value in a gold investment strategy uh, that involves buying it, adding to it, and also hedging it. One of the rules of the super wealthy is never to fall in love with an asset. And assets are simply instruments to make money with over periods of time. So you should enjoy the appreciation of gold, but never leave your money unprotected and vulnerable to forces that you don't control. Well, I want to thank you for listening to my thoughts. All the assets that we've discussed here can be invested in. But I want you to understand that not all of these assets are appropriate for all investors. And you need to carefully consider the risk considerations of investing in any asset and understand that there's always a risk of loss of funds. Consult with competent financial professionals before making any investment decisions. I hope that I've given you some ideas on how to protect, grow, and diversify your hard-earned assets and how to hopefully build the type of lives with your, your funds that you and your families desire. Thank you. Please give Tom Fowler a call. He's the president of Commodities and Securities, Inc. 
and his phone number is 646-391-3549. His website is on the screen. I highly recommend you give him a call as a man with much experience as the insider on Wall Street. Health care is your responsibility. It is not the responsibility of the government, and it is not the responsibility of the doctor. A while back, I went in for a pilot's physical. I've been a pilot, aircraft pilot, for many years, have a commercial license, instrument rating, A&P mechanics license. And I went in to renew my pilot's physical, and the doctor said, Chaplain, you got problems. Your blood pressure is too high. And I said, what is it? Well, he said, it's about 85 or 150. Oh, I said, that's way too high. He said, I want you to do something for me. Come in my office in the morning, get calm. You got to calm down. And sit here in my office, let me take your blood pressure. I did, and he was able to get me to the point where I could pass my pilot's physical. And I've been flying, of course, for many, many years, even though I'm not flying right now. And he said, okay, I'll be able to pass you. Well, I had to do something to keep that blood pressure down, and... My lovely wife said, honey, if you'll eat garlic, it'll take care of your blood pressure. Well, I began eating garlic till I lost all of my friends, Nellie. And at that point, I said, there's got to be something better. Well, last summer, uh, we were traveling, and somebody introduced me to something called proarginine. And I, they said, it'll, do, it, it'll work on your blood pressure. And I said, well, fine. I think I'll give it a try. I did. And I was on proarginine for three months. Uh, one day I thought, well, I think I'll take my blood pressure. I bought a professional blood pressure machine. Not one of these kinds like you buy at the drugstore, but it cost me about $200, and it does it precisely, just like the doctor can do it. And I thought, well, I've been on proarginine for now for about three months. I think I'll try my blood pressure, and let's see what it is. And sure enough, I went on the machine, and I tried to see what my blood pressure was. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. My blood pressure was down to about, uh, if I remember correctly, about 75, 76. And my high blood pressure down was down to about 112 or 14. It was amazing what it had done for me. It literally brought, brought my blood pressure down to the point that I am amazed. I'm 76 years of age, and I'm out there jogging. <laughs> I mean, I don't give out of breath. I'm not short of breath. And the other day, my son, Daniel, 18 years of age, he and I were jogging together. And he said, Daddy, this has got to be on Funniest Home Videos. I said, what are you talking about? He said, 76-year-old dad jogging with his 18-year-old son. I couldn't have done that a year ago. I couldn't have done it two years ago. Folks, there is, there's coming something in America. You must prepare for your health. It is so important that you do what you've got to do right now. I have a friend. Uh, he lives close to where I live. Uh, not too long ago, he, he began to have some chest discomforts while he was on the job working. He has a strenuous job, and he was taken to the emergency room. He stayed in the hospital for one and a half days, and they handed him a bill for $25,000. Do you realize why you've got to start taking care of your health? I have another friend. who He's the manager of my fulfillment center. He was playing racquetball here just a few months ago, and he passed out. He woke up in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. He didn't have any choice. They took him there automatically. He stayed three days, and they had him a bill for $45,000. Health products that will take care of your needs must be in your preparedness supplies. And there are two of them. There are two of them. I, I beg of you to get them. There are two preparations that you need for your, you need to start taking it right now. Number one is something that will take care of your cardiovascular system, and you'll see it in just a moment. Number two, you must do something with the immune system. Remember, God gave you an immune system, and if that immune system is strong enough, it can overcome every known disease. I care not what it is, and there is a way you can do it. Number one, you need proarginine for your cardiovascular system, 
you, you, you don't have to be short of breath. There is no reason to ever have a problem with your heart. And you need laminide to boost the immune system. It is God's given way of doing it. Quickly, my wife, she's from Poland. She came to America. We had to get her green card and her citizenship. In the course of getting her green card, the doctor said, now, we'll have to give her an MMR and a DPT shot. I said, no, no way. You're not going to do it.